Hello and welcome once again to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post, and Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community of North Carolina now since 2003. We've been bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and now our latest effort, the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. And in this series, we reach out and talk to our friends, the guides and captains from up and down the North Carolina coast, and ask them to share their knowledge, their insights with our viewers, with our listeners on how to catch more fish more often, with the hopes that when you have that confidence of more fish more often, it'll just get you out on the water. We want you spending more time with family and friends on the water, and we hope this is part in part a vehicle for accomplishing that. This episode is, to- is titled slow trolling for wahoo slow trolling for wahoo and it features captain mike dupree of the x-rated fishing team he also runs charters for lone wolf fishing charters and we're going to talk about when where gear and then we're going to get right into you know what i think is very intriguing you know a break from the high speed trolling we're going to do slow trolling for wahoo so stay tuned you want to hear about this um, before I get to Captain Mike Dupree, though, I'd like to introduce my regular co-host, my only co-host, my partner in this project, and that is Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. What's going on, Gary? Hey, man. I'm doing well. Looking yeah. good. Got the collared shirt on. Yeah, man. It's I clean good. up. Yeah. I haven't shaved, but I did get some sun. I haven't shaved, but you can't tell, so it's all right. You can't. <laughs> you haven't shaved since high school. I need to, Yeah, I know, right? I need to zoom in so people can know I do have some facial hair. We'll pencil some stuff some in. Some straggly facial when hair. When we get bigger, we'll have makeup. <laughs> exactly, right? I'll just, I'll just get implants. <laughs> hair implants. We're going to tattoo <laughs> facial hair on you. <laughs> hey, ladies do it for their eyebrows. Right. Or eyelids or whatever. Right. Something to do with their eyes. Yeah, I can do that. Or a neck tattoo. That's uh, Yeah, that's what I'm going to go for. It's like this is the Punisher. <laughs> <laughs> oh man well uh speaking of <laughs> people helping us out with this podcast and making that neck tattoo possible <laughs> it's a uh, marine House warehouse center we appreciate those guys uh, great sponsors of this episode and uh so i got a little word from them we'll be right back this is preston with marine warehouse center we're your headquarters for carolina skiff sea chaser paramarine and sailfish boat if you're looking for tons of features and value without compromise come check out our inventory in person or check us out online Definitely catch a wahoo out of one of those boats, Gary. Yeah. Every boat I think we put in that. <laughs> Every boat in that ad right there. You can probably catch a boat. I would love the chance. Let's call up Marine Warehouse and say we got a new angle. We need a boat to go and explore the this fishing perfect. that we're talking about. That would be a perfect episode. I mean, not an episode, a perfect situation to get a... To for get, us. For us. Not for them. <laughs> But for us, for us. <laughs> I'm going to call Lil right before we're done with this episode. Oh, man, let's talk about how you can watch, how you can listen. I know you're going to come right back to that Marine Warehouse thing. I am. Thing, but I'm going to say this because I got it on the screen. All right. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Stitcher, Google Play, and make sure you like and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, one, so you get all the new episodes as they come out. But two, it helps YouTube go, Fisherman's Post has it going on. We want to promote their videos in the algorithm. So we appreciate that. We do appreciate that. We appreciate Marine Warehouse Center, which is why I want to come back to them. I've messed this up so many times in the last few episodes. That's all right. I'm I'm a good cleanup man. (laughs) As we discussed earlier. So here's what's been happening as a reminder. Been saying, all right, Billy Thorpe, what do you know about the price of a hat? What do you know about the price of a shirt? Yep. I'm going to take a little bit of a left turn. All right. I was going to ask you very uh, predictably how much are they selling the visors for, but I thought you'd probably look that up. You'd probably go online and know that it was 20 bucks that they're selling visors for. Are you going to ask me the price of a boat? I don't know. Of an engine. Of an engine. Oh, I might. No, nah, I don't a know. A Suzuki, four horsepower. You can go online, click click the button, say buy now, and they will ship it to you, I guess. I don't know. Or maybe you, you have to pick it up. Four a horses? Suzuki four horsepower. Good for canoes. Good for real little boats. Okay. What do you think the retail is on a Suzuki four horsepower? I'm going to go with $999.99. And you'd be pretty close. $1,200. $1,200. 15 bucks. That's not bad. Remember, no 99. This is Emmett. He doesn't want to oh, count yeah, 12, change. 12, what is it? He doesn't even want ones. 
He'll take ones with shirts. I'm going to take hundreds. But when he's selling engines, he doesn't want ones. So he rounded it to 1215. Perfect. I bet if you said 1200, he'd say, okay, keep the 15. I don't know. Would he? I don't know him that way. I haven't done that bi- a big business transaction like that. I don't know either. I, that would be interesting. Somebody go go offer him twelve hundred for that engine. Let us know. Hey Billy, what I'd like doing? I'd like to see a fish photo. And since we're talking Wahoo, I would love it if the fish photo was a Wahoo photo. Man, let me see what I can come up with. Oh, look at that! Hey. It's a Wahoo photo. All hey, right. All right. <laughs> uh, Jason Sloan here with a Wahoo that he hooked while fishing sixty five miles offshore out of the Masonboro Inlet. Good looking Wahoo. I don't know that much about Wahoo fishing, man. So I'm in store for. It looks a good. It looks good. Man, I did. It was all lit up. It had its colors. It's going to eat well. I'm sure it fought hard. And what I want you to do, and this is what I want you to do every episode, in part because I'm worried that you're not paying attention, <laughs> that you're, you know, on your computer playing games I'm or something. I'm sliding into those DMs on Instagram. When I finish talking with Captain Mike Dupree, I'm going to come back to you for Billy's best takeaway. I got it. I'm ready. And then I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of information. That's going to be good. It's going to be a lot. It's going to be good. All right. So now I'm going to my guest. My guest today, Captain Mike Dupree of the X-Rated Fishing Team. He also runs charters for Lone Wolf Sport Fishing Charters. And we have him here to talk about slow trolling for Wahoo. I'm excited about this topic. And again, we're going to talk about when, where, gear, and then we're going to get to the slow troll itself. Captain Mike, welcome to the show. Pleasure to have you on. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. And uh, to be here. And like we said, man, we love your we love your office. We love your backdrop. You already have validity there. You couldn't fake what you have behind you. But I am still going to bring you the question: Why should people listen to what you have to say about Oahu? Okay. Why should people listen to me about Oahu? Well, I grew up on Harker's Island, fishing inshore, flounder, redfish, trout, um, and I ventured offshore the older I got. Got used to catching king mackerel, dolphins, stuff like that. Caught my first wahoo, and it was like an obsession. I fell in love with it. Um, I packed my brain every minute, every waking hour that I could think of. I was watching YouTube. I was calling on captains I knew, um, asking friends who had success wahoo fishing. And I have drilled myself, you know, just completely focused on wahoo. And just so happens that... I kind of picked up the knack for it, figured it out, and I haven't lost the love. I just chase wahoos all the time. People call me all the time, ask me to take them wahoo fish, and I put them on the first wahoos, the biggest wahoos, the most wahoos, um, and it's year-round, which is another reason why I love it. So, Well, right on, Not mate. sales pitch, but if you want to catch a wahoo, I, I feel like I have the uh, the ability to help you do so. I mean, if we weren't on the air, I would be giving you my credit card right now to be book, putting down a deposit, man. I, you already <laughs> have me excited for Wahoo, and we haven't even started talking. But my understanding is that you've seen a couple episodes, so you know what's coming next. And this is the two questions, and these are two non-fishing-related questions before we get to the main course. This is scary. <laughs> I mean, they're not that good. I, I hate, I don't even want them built up because then it's going to be anticlimactic. I have been saying here for a few episodes that I feel like I'm losing my creativity in this area. And so um, what I did was I played off of, I played off of the lone wolf sport fishing charters. So your two questions are about wolves. Are you ready? And I actually, oh, I'm, I'm taking it very easy on you. They're true, false questions. So you got a 50% chance both times. Here we are. Okay. Question number one, true, false. The wolf is the largest member of the dog family. Ah, dude, there's some huge dogs like over in Europe and like New Zealand and stuff, but I'm going to, I'm going to say false. I love that you thought out loud. I feel this feels like a real TV game show. The fact that you (laughs) thought out loud, because I think that's how they coach you. (laughs) I didn't coach you. You just did that on your own. Um, I have the answer is true. Now I'm I'm Googling. You can argue with Google. You're not arguing with me. All right. All you have to do is get one, and then you get Billy's voice on your home answering machine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question number two, true, false. Once a wolf has found a mate, they usually stay together for life. Definitely going to say false. Billy will not be talking on your voice machine. I'm wrong again, I picked two true questions. However. Terrible. I need to educate myself on wolves. <laughs> I, stay, I say you stay focused on Wahoo. I say your plan has been working and no need, 
No need to digress. No need to expand. Just stay locked in on Wahoo. Do it better than anyone else. And let's start that Wahoo. Con- let's start that Wahoo communication conversation. So you've already alluded to it year round. Maybe a little bit more specifics though when we talk about the best for when when it comes to Wahoo fishing. Okay. Yes. In North Carolina, we are very lucky. Lucky. I mean, we're very blessed. I should say. We have Wahoo here year round. We have native Wahoo. We have Wahoo that live here. We also have Wahoo that, you know, travel and migrate up and down the coast. Well, with that being said, if I had was given one specific time of the year to go focus on Wahoo, it's definitely going to be the fall. And it, it, with saying the fall, I'm going to say, I'm going to say October, November is the best months, if, if you will. Um, but we always have an early push in August, which we are kind of experiencing right now. There's a there's a smaller body of fish that's pushing through. Um, so the the major push is definitely October, November. So major push, but but December, January, February, I got ch- I got shots all the way, man, all the way. I mean, and and keep in mind again, December and January, a lot of people are focused on the bluefin because that's when the market's hot for the bluefin but with the commercial guys and even you know with all the social media outlets and YouTube and everything else, there's a lot of more recreational guys getting into that. So when the tuna grounds are crowded, I'm still out there chasing Wahoo, you know, 40 degree weather. I'm out there chasing Wahoo. What about, what about when, as it applies to size of fish, are you seeing any difference in the size of fish going around the calendar? Yeah. It seems like, um, like I said, in the October, November season, if you will, we, uh, we definitely see bigger fish. You know, it's it's not uncommon to catch 60, 70, 80 pound fish. And if you, like I said, with social media, um, all the fishing reports, your fishing report, Fisherman's Post, um, you'll notice that North Carolina is actually a what we call a sleeper house, which means not a lot of people know, but there's quite a few fish caught, you know, right at the 100 pound mark and even over 100 pounds. And that's usually typically that's in November, end of October, November. All right, so transition with me into where now. So just about around the cl- around the calendar, you know, maybe a little highlight in October, November. Uh, what can you share with us about where to go to target the Wahoo? Where to go? Um, you can go anywhere. I mean, there's been 90-pound Wahoos caught 10 miles offshore. There's been 90-pound Wahoos caught in 600 fathoms or 3,600 feet. Uh, my typical focus for wahoo is and i'm gonna I, give me a second i'm used to talking in fathoms so i say between 30 fathoms and about 45 fathoms um i'm gonna say right at at the 150 foot break all the way out to i don't know you know right at 350 feet i i, I rarely fish deeper than 300 and 300 350 feet but it, i mean it depends on the water so um uh, the main if i had to narrow down an area or a a specific depth i'm going to say in the spring you want to be in 180 feet in the fall you want to be in 220 feet that's where you want to start now the easy out um i'm not sure what the i guess analogy or whatever you you spring from 180 you know you spring up and then you fall to 220 so spring 180 fall 220 it's just a, a little way to remember that so why is it, what is it about these numbers? Like, why do you think 150 is where you start to have more confidence? Why do you think after 350 would be when you're not as focused? Okay, well, you know how North Carolina, the bank works in North Carolina, where, where our break is, if you will. Um, a lot of people, if you say, that I'm fishing the break today, they think you're fishing a temperature break. Well, when we're Wahoo fishing, we're not Wahoo fishing a temperature break. That's not the break we're referring to. We're referring to where the continental shelf starts to fall off. So when tides come in and out and, you know, the wind blowing and the currents and everything, the water pulls the bait offshore, like a down the, uh, if you're from here to here, this is close to shore, this is offshore. And the, the land drops off, you know, the bottom of the ocean floor drops off. Okay. Well, those, those Wahoo will stay in between 150 and 180 feet because they're, the bait is being pulled off by the tides. Now, when the Gulf Stream is running south to north, when the Gulf Stream hits that bank, it kind of stops it. So when the Gulf Stream hits the bank and the water stops from going up onto the, to the flats, 
the bait can't really go anywhere up here. The, the bait stays right here. Bait being blackfin tuna, um, flying fish, um, and whatever. Wahoo does not have a specific food he eats. He's opportunistic, and he will eat anything that you put in front of him. And so is it, it's not necessarily fishing over a live bottom. It's not anything necessarily that holds them down there. And, it, and it's not a temperature break. It's really just slope and water depth. That's correct. Um, in, my, in my findings, um, I can touch on temperature breaks real quick if you want me to. Um, yes, please. If I'm fishing for mahi or sailfish or blue marlin or like if I have a charter, when I have charters, I can't really focus on wahoo unless that's what the person specifically called me and said, hey, I want to catch wahoo. If a lady from Charlotte calls me and says, hey, I want to take my kids fishing. I just want to catch some fish. I'm going to go after dolphin put their kids on something that I can stay busy fishing all day long. I'm not focused on one fish. With that being said, if I'm targeting mahi, sailfish, marlin, stuff like that, I'm looking for a sharp edge, a a, a green to blue edge, um, weed lines, uh, 85 degree water that is bumping up against, um, like 80 degree water, you get that sharp rip right there. Um, now, don't get me wrong, wahoos will be there, but it, I have found that wahoos like a more subtle break in the water temperature. They, uh, I've caught more wahoo on a 75.4 degree water touching a 76 degree water than I have, you know, a 75 degree water touching the 80 foot. I mean, I'm um, 80 degree water. Uh, like I said, my findings, sure, and man. Wahoo and anybody that I talk to, and, and you can ask anybody, Wahoos for some reason they like that that subtle break, they don't like a real sharp edge. All right, so when and where we've 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 touched on, and so we're in our sort of notes, it was gear and then we're going into slow trolling. So I just want to remind people as we begin this gear conversation that, you know, you do high speed trolling, you have done high speed trolling, you see that it works. But for this particular episode, we decided, you know, there's stuff out there on high speed. So let's really zero in on the slow troll for Wahoo since I think that's unique. So let's have that gear conversation as it relates to the slow troll method we're going to talk about in the following. Okay, the gear for slow trolling, and the gear that I use slow trolling is no different than the gear I use high speed trolling, with the exception of when I'm high speed trolling, I'll have 480 wides or 680 wides on the boat, and when I'm regular slow trolling, which is my preferred way to do it, I'm running 450 wides and then 280 wides. So it, you're, you have to have tough gear. You're, you're, you're targeting a fish that is mean. He has razor sharp teeth. When he hits your bait, it doesn't matter if you're slow trolling or high speed trolling. He hits your bait so fast. It's so furious. It's, it's unmistakable. Um, they rip off two, 300 yards on the first run and then you get them halfway to the boat and they do it again. Um, I can show you right here. This is a 50 watt. All right. Jeez. All right. This is, Typical 50 wide, you know, six foot. It's a 50 wide on the back of my rod. I have 100 pound braid on the top shot. I have a 50 pound mono. Um, and, and that's that's what I'm pulling like my flat lines with. And and like my short riggers and my long riggers. And I'll get into the um into the weights in a minute. I use a lot of weights. And then this is an 80 wide. It's a planer rod. You see how it has a bent butt on it? Yep. This is what we're using to pull our big heavy weights, like our 48 ounce weights, to get our baits down deep. Um, and we're also pulling a planer on these. We run number eights all the way to 24 planers. Okay. Um, you have to have, you can run a planer on a 50 wide, um, but your 50 wide is not going to last long. You may get five or six trips out of it. The planer puts so much pressure on that. You're trolling it anywhere from six and a half to eight and a half knots and going against current and tides and your planer going down 30 feet. It's just so much pressure that you have to have a substantial reel to be able to control that or to be able to handle that, that stress. So I highly recommend if you're going to slow troll for Wahoo or high speed troll, either one, you, you cannot skimp or, or, 
you can't bargain um, your gear. You have to have, I'm not going to say the best of the best, but you, you know, you get what you pay for, in other words. All right. So I guess this is where we go to the spread. Like I, I follow what we're talking about, rods and reels. I think you made it very easy to follow along. Um, mm. So I, I think this, I guess the next move is like, all right, man, you got me out there. I'm in 180. I'm in 220. I'm, you know, depending on the spring or the fall. And what are, what are you deploying? What am I deploying? I am on our on our planter bait or our planter rod. This is our this is just a this is our planter setup. Um, we paint our planters black. I highly suggest doing that. Um, here I hold this up. You can see the scratches. See the scratches on that? Yeah. That is from Wahoo's hitting the planter. Like I said, a Wahoo does not discriminate. He eats everything. Um, we run a bridle system where this clips in line. Uh, in front of our leader so when we get this to the boat we can unhook our planer off the main line and stick it in the boat and we can actually reel the bait and the fish all the way to the rod tip um, on my planer rod i'm always running this color blue and white okay i'm running primarily on, on when i'm running the boat if i'm captain or mating or whatever i put all of my light lures on the left side all of my dark lures on the right side. Left, light, is right. Why that is that? Sense. I'm sorry? Why is that? Why light colors on one side, why dark colors on the other side? Because I know if, if I get bit on my, say my left long, and I'm, I'm pulling this, and my left long gets bit, and I don't immediately change all my spread to this bait. What I'll do is I'll wait for the next bite. If I get bit again on my left side, I know, hey, these Wahoos today, they're chewing bright colors. I'm going to keep everything bright. If I get two fish on the same color, everything else gets changed out. Period. Does that make sense? Yeah, man, that makes sense. All so, right, cool. So, on that plane, so we're starting with the planer rod. You're having, are you putting out one planer rod? Yes, sir. I put out one planer rod. Um, sometimes I'll do two planer rods, but it's never, it's only if it's like me and my mate or, um, uh, Maybe me and two other guys. If I have a crowd of people in the boat, I will never put out two planer rods. You, you need to get used to running one before you get used to running two because you can you can get tangled up real easy. If a wahoo hits your right planer and does a three hundred yard scream, you know towards your starboard side, he's going to tangle up in your other planer. You have to be ready for that. And what so, I, if somebody's starting out, I would not suggest running two planers. Um, you need to get some experience under your belt before you do that. But yes, I do run two planers sometimes. And that planer, what size? What size planer are you going to start with? And we've said slow troll, but we, uh, if you gave it, I missed it. Like, what speed are we talking about with slow troll? All right, slow trolling it, it, from six and a half to about eight and a half knots. I, I never really go faster than eight and a half knots. And in saying that, you have to remember that if you are trolling south, you're going against the current. So if you're, a lot of people use their GPS or their graph, their machine to tell how fast they're going. If you're going six knots south and on your machine, and your mach that's what your machine is reading, six knots, but you're going against a two knot current. You, you, you follow me here? Yep. So that's not your speed. Your six knots is not your actual speed. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're really running like eight knots. Mm -hmm. So... If you're rolling from south to north and your machine is showing 10 knots, well, you're really only running eight knots because you're going with the current. You know, you're in a two knot current. And that's another, you know, you have to know your current, which is easy. You get out to where you're going to fish, you stop the boat, you put it in neutral, never turn your engines off, that's bad luck. Stop your boat, put it in neutral, and get your stuff rigged and ready. And while you're drifting, you know, your, your graph will keep up with that, and you'll be able to look on your graph and say, hey, we have a 1.6 knot drift, and that's the way we're going, or we're going to go against it or whatever, and you can do your math there. And what size planer is that, and about how deep into the water column is that going? This one's actually an 8. Okay? All right. I, I'm going to tell people this, too. You can go into any tackle store you want, and there's going to be five number 8 planers side by side, and they're all going to be different sizes. The eight is referring to this weight right here, this keel weight. That's what makes it a number eight planer. It's the weight of the planer, not the size of the plate. So you can have 
like I have number six planers with plates twice as big. The, uh, believe it or not, the plate does not determine how deep your bait goes. The, a plate will only go as, as far as another plate. It's, it's all in the weight. So I, I usually start out, um, the hotter it is, the deeper I go. Like, uh, right now, if I was to go fishing tomorrow, I would, without a hesitation, I would probably drop a 16, a number 16 planer. And, um, and that'll get how deep? Yeah, 40 feet, 45 feet. Okay. And so that's our planer rod and you got blue and white on that. And why, yes, why blue and white on the planer rod? Well, I just want, I want, you know, you're, you're deeper in the water column, so you don't have as much light penetration coming from the surface. Okay. So I want, I want a bright color. Now I used to pull dark colors, but I just found that, you know, I was like, Hey, one day I was like, Hey, let's try blue and white on the planter rod and see what happens. And it just, I started noticing I get bit more on blue and white on the planter rod than I do on a dark color. Okay. If it's springtime, and I don't mean to cut you off, I'm sorry. If it's springtime, I'm going to pull a dark color on the planter rod to try it out. Cause that's when the, the you can ask, you know, Rick Croson, he'll tell you the black fin tuna are stupid thick in the springtime. So I want something that's going to mimic a black fin tuna, which is going to be a black and red or a black and purple. So I'll put that down and try it out for sure. All right. So where are we going to go from the planer rod? You're going to take me to the riggers. You're going to take me to the flat line. What, you, you dictate, walk me through the yes. spread. So I got the planer rod. Let's just say you're, you're, I'm facing the, the back of the boat. Okay. I got my planer rod on my left side because I want all my light colors on the left side. So I got a planer rod with a blue and white down. Yep. Um, off there, off my flat line on the right side, we run, we run trolling weights. Now I'm going to tell you, this is very important as well. Just like painting your planers black, you need to fo make sure that when you get trolling weights, that it has cable in it and that the cable slides freely through it. And I'm not being a salesman. I'm just telling you from experience, this is going to get bit. A wahoo's going to bite this. Going through the water at eight knots, it looks like a huge Boston mackerel or cigar minnow or something, or Spanish mackerel even for that matter. They're going to bite this, so you have to have cable. Again, you're wahoo fishing. you got a lot of money and time invested in this. you got, you know, X amount of dollars, however much Billy spent on his boat, that's how much you got on your boat. You got all this gear. Get the the best that you can afford. Uh, so, plane a rod on my left side, flat line on my right side with the weight. I'm also going to run a weight on my left short rigger, and I'm going to run a weight on my right short rigger. The heavier the weight, and usually on my on the the shortest one, the closest corner. My weight's going to be 32 ounces, maybe 48 ounces. It depends on the current. You want your heaviest weight to be closest to the boat. So I'll run a 32 ounce weight off the corner, which is my flat. And again, we're talking, we got the planer rod down on the left side. Yep. On the right corner, I have the heaviest weight in front of my lure. And then I'll start staggering. I'll take that 32 and put it on my, my right corner. Then I'll take a 24 and put it on my left short. Then I'll take a 16 and put it on my right short. And then my longs, I'm going to leave them flat. I'm not going to put any weights on them at all. Unless they're skipping across the top. I don't like bait skipping across the top for Wahoo. Um, if I'm having problems, like if it's really high wind and we have a lot of bow in our line, um, or bag as we call it, then I'll put some very small weights, maybe some 8-ounce or some 12-ounce some weights on those just to keep them in the water. So why are we putting the heaviest weight closest to the boat? Okay. The, your, your prop wash is air. Okay. I don't care if you have one engine, if you have two engines, or if you have like Billy's on Billy's boat, he's got five outboards, 400 <laughs> horsepower. If when you have engines on a boat, especially a center console with outboards, you have air coming off your prop wash. Yes. Well, it, it, it's common sense that air rises. So at the closest to your boat is where the air is going to be the deepest. That's where the bubbles are going to be the deepest. And I want my baits to be below that air. You follow me? Yep. So the further away in your wake that you get with your prop wash, your air is actually closer to the surface. So you can, you can use lighter weights and just have your baits just under the prop wash. 
And why is it important to have the baits under the prop wash and not mixed up with any of that air flow coming off? I want, and maybe this is just personal, but this is, you know, again, what I've learned personally, I want that Wahoo to hit that bait without a doubt. I don't want him running through the prop wash guessing. Um, and I'm sure you've seen it on numerous YouTube videos or fishing shows or whatever, how official knock a bait and what we call short strike. And you know, it happens once or twice and the fish is gone and you, you don't ever catch the fish. I want my, I want the odds stacked in my favor. I want the bait to be completely 100% visible so that when that Wahoo gets raised up or he sees it from the side or whatever he does, when he goes after that bait, I want him to have a clear view and, and be able to smash that bait and, you know, mouth wide open. I want the whole bait in his mouth. So that's why I want, all my baits away from the prop wash. I follow that. All right. So now maybe a quick, like you stagger the lengths too. So that maybe run us through just some, some rough numbers. The flat line is back. How far the short riggers are back. How far the deep ones are back. Yeah, the long absolutely. riggers are back. How far? Yep. My planter rod. Um, I say, I, I'm going to say about 70 feet. And the reason I say that is because I want it. I want my planter, the line coming off my planter rod. I want it like, if this is the rod, I want the line to go down at a, a little bit more than a 45 degree angle. That way I know that plate's digging in the water. And if, if you let your planter rod out and you can see your plate on your, on your, uh, planter, I'm sorry. If you can see it, it's not out far enough. You okay. need to get it down deep to where you can't see it. So I'm going to say 75 feet for that one. And then we always have our right corner. We always have it at a hundred feet and then I'll do my, left short at 150 feet, my right short at 200 feet, and my left long at 250, my right long at 300, and I always run a shotgun too, always run a shotgun. And I didn't say that a while ago. Um, on our planter rods and our, our close, our flats, and then our short riggers, we're running, you know, that we, everybody calls them sea witches, but these are actually battle axes. They're made by short rigger tackle. Um, that's where I get mine from. I'm not saying go get yours from there. I'm just saying that's where I get mine from. Short rigger tackle, they're hand tied. Um, I love them. They have flashers in them so the Wahoos can see them. So I'll run the sea witch style on number nine, high biz wire. You see that? Yep. And this is what we call three pools. So this is approximately 18 feet of wire on this. So when, we, uh, when, when I tie these, I pull three times off of my spool to get my length of wire. Um, and everybody I know does that same thing. On my longs, especially if I'm having trouble with them staying down, we run these. And I'm sure everybody's seen them. This is actually a Halco, the Halco lure. Um, this is called a 220 Max. These things, you can high speed or slow troll with these. They swim from five knots to 30 knots. It doesn't matter. And it's been proven at 30 knots. I'm not just saying, throwing a number out there. <laughs> uh, I will always have one in my spread, but typically starting off, this will be my shotgun bait. And by shotgun, I mean my long center bait. And I'm talking way back there, you know, 400, 500 feet, you know, almost 200 yards. So that's it. I'll hold it closer to the camera so you can see. It's a very heavy bait. It's got rattlers in it. J hooks. No trebles. J's. And uh, they're tough, and I rigged these also, again, with number nine wire. And of course, if we were high speed, we would run them with 400-pound um, cable or 300-pound cable. But slow trolling, like I said, number nine wire on everything that I have. Three pulls. One, two, three. From my rod tip to, let's say, on my main line, you get to your swivel. Okay. Swivel, we hook to our trolling weight, and then from the back of our trolling weight to our skirt or whatever we're using, our dead valley, who is what I troll. Um, I have these leaders made up. These are 75-foot leaders. Some people use um, fluorocarbon. Some people use monofilament. I use monofilament. The reason I use monofilament, here, I'll hold this up. That's a 300-pound snap swivel. There's one on both ends. It's 75 feet long. It goes from the snap swivel on my main, I mean, uh, from the, yeah, from the snap swivel on the trolling weight to my bait. I need that mono between my trolling weight 
or my planter rod or whatever I'm hooked to, I need that 75 feet for stretch. Like I said, a Wahoo hits at 7,000 miles an hour. When he hits it, it's, he's going to scream it off. I don't want to take the risk, especially like um, a lot of guys I get on their boats and they're running all braid. I don't want that fish to smash a bait at 100 miles an hour, rip off 200 yards of line, and the, the braid doesn't stretch, so it snaps the hook out of the mouth or rips the hook out of the mouth. I need to stretch in the monofilament. Monofilament stretches 30% of its length. So I know when a, when a fish hits, I, I have that security to saying, hey, you know, I got a little bit of elasticity in my line. You know, we can, we can uh, feather this fish to the boat, if you will. So always run a leader. I mean, I don't care what you do. If you don't take any words or any, any uh, I don't know, advice from me, when you're Wahoo fishing, please use monofilament leaders. Fluorocarbon does not have the stretch that monofilament does. That's why I use monofilament. And that's 150 pound monofilament, by the way. 150 pound. So mm -hmm. we're offshore. We're not exactly in my wheelhouse. So when I have that monofilament leader coming off of a trolling weight and we get that fish to the boat, I'm only reeling up as far as that trolling weight because unlike the planer, it's not a snap in, snap out. You are then handing hand lining the fish in from that trolling weight. Yes. In most situations. Now me personally, we run bridles on everything. Okay. And, and I don't want to confuse anybody, but I run bridles on my trolling weights as well. Um, and we just started doing this about a year ago, maybe two years ago. Um, somebody had mentioned it and we were like, why didn't we think of that? So we started doing it and now it's like, it's habit. Um, I have bridles on almost every rod I own. Um, so yes, it, when you, if you're, if you're doing a, a typical snap swivel off your main line to your trolling weight, and then a snap swivel from your trolling weight, you know, to your leader, to your bait, then yes, you would reel the weight up to the boat safely, very carefully, and everybody needs to clear out of the way, get the weight in the boat, and then you would hand line the fish or what we call leadering or wiring the fish to the boat. Uh, if you're going to do that, I highly suggest using gloves. Uh, on Billy's center console with his five 400 horse outboards, he probably knows that a 40 pound Wahoo hanging off the back of a 150 pound mono who is mad and angry because he has this hook in his mouth and he doesn't know what's going on and he swims off and darts this way. If you're not wearing gloves and protecting yourself, you're going to cut your hand off. Um, so always wear gloves. I have these gloves. These are Kevlar lines. If you can see right here, like uh, in the pinky part, this is if my hand was to go on there, it'd be like this. This pinky part has Kevlar on it so that I can take wraps and pull the fish to me. Like I said, if I'm on somebody's boat who doesn't use bridles, I always have my gloves with me. So how long before you change out of bait, man? If you're slow trolling, you, you leave them out indefinitely, or do you have any rotation? What's your thought on that? Yes, and I learned this from another, from a famous mate on Moorhead City Waterfront. Um, I'll give him a shout out. Uh, Wahoo and Box, Marty Hyatt. He told me, and a mutual friend, he said, if you're not checking your planer rod every eight minutes, you've lost a fish. And if you check your planer rod every eight minutes, you're going to learn really fast how to correctly uh, set a planer board to make it come to the surface. Because if you don't, your arms will be gone by the third time you do it. With that being said, we check our planer bait every eight to ten minutes, always. Um, it's down there in the in the current. It's, it, it has more potential of getting washed out. Um, our other baits are usually about every 15 minutes, and and I say that sparingly because when you're wahoo fishing, you're on edge. You're just you're waiting for that big bad zebra to come out of, off of the bottom and slam your 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 bait. So we're always like I'll always walk to the left side and reel up a bait and check it and make sure it's swimming good. And you don't have to reel it all the way in to do that. You can just reel it up and check out swimming. And if it's still swimming good, you can let it back out to where it was. And, you know, the guys that fish with me, they do the same thing. So always check your baits. And I'm going to say 15 minutes goes by and nobody's checked the baits. You may want to check them. That would be my, that'd be my rule of thumb. Eight minutes on the planter rod, 15 minutes on your flats. All right. So let's say we've orchestrated all this. 
and we are successful. We have a Wahoo that's screaming offline. What are you doing? Okay. If a Wahoo is screaming offline and he's on one of my longs, like he's on the right long or he's on the shotgun or he's on the left long, I'll leave the other baits out there. And, and what we'll do is we never touch the rod when a Wahoo hits your bait. Don't ever run over to the rod and start cranking. Um, that's actually rule number two. Rule number one is do not touch the throttles. Everybody wants to run up and pull it down to neutral or slow the butt down. Do not do that. Do not touch the throttles. When that Wahoo's screaming off, we'll go over to the other rods and reels and we'll grab the lines you know, on the above the reel and we'll jerk it. And we'll reel it in a couple times and we'll jerk it and we'll jerk it. And what we're doing is we're trying to create another bite. In doing this and chasing these Wahoos, they're not schooled up. Our Wahoos do not school together. They're they're very competitive fish. They, you know, if if you have three Wahoos laying here at 60 feet of water and you pull a bait, they're going to race to it. So you hear a lot of people referring to Wahoo as pack, like, hey, we ran across a pack of Wahoo. You, you never hear people say, well, there was a school of Wahoo over here on this wreck today. Um, we always say packs. And uh, so if, if conditions are right and there's one Wahoo there and you get bet by one Wahoo, then chances are there's more there. Um, that means your bait's there, your water's there, you're, you're on the, the contour where the, the bait's getting washed over the shelf. And with that being said, I get hit on my left long and he screamed out 200 yards of line. Um, I'm, we're going to run to the other rods. We do not touch the throttles. We run to the other rods and we, we give them a couple cranks and then we jerk on the main line and try to get some of that erratic action on those baits that are still back there because you might entice another bite. And it's always fun to catch three Wahoo. It's, it's fantastic to catch one Wahoo, but it's, I mean, it's, it's awesome to catch five Wahoo. Um, we've actually had five on at one time. We haven't landed five because that is very difficult. But we've had five on at one time, and I think we got two out of those, or maybe three. I can't remember. So you're not pulling back on the throttle because you want to maintain speed for the best yes, chances of another bite. And that bite happens, and you're telling no one to touch the reel because? I don't want anybody touching that reel because I don't want anything. I don't want so many people, and, and I'm very guilty of it. And everybody I know is guilty of it. You run over to a reel when it's screaming off, and you push the drag up and you start cranking on it. Okay, well, when a fish, especially a wahoo or a billfish um, even, when they take line off of a reel, as the diameter of that spool gets lower and lower and lower because the line is leaving it, the drag is actually increasing. So let's say you have your reel set at 18 pounds of drag and a wahoo hits it and takes off 200 yards of line, you're, now you're at about 23 pounds of drag. Does that make sense? Yep. So that's why I don't want anybody touching that reel until that fish is starting to slow down. And you trust me, you can tell when a fish is starting to slow down because the scream that that reel makes when a wahoo bites is unmistakable. I have kingfish, marlinfish, um, dolphin, you know, we've caught barracudas, we've caught makos, black tips. Nothing screams like a wahoo. Nothing. It's unmistakable. So you'll hear that long scream that. And then it'll start to slow down a little bit. like, And when that slowing down starts, now keep in mind, 30 seconds has gone by. So we've already done all of our jerking on lines or whatnot and trying to entice another bite. And if we haven't got another bite, we'll reel them up, get some fish to the boat very carefully and safely um, with our gloves on. And we're always wearing boots. If you're Wahoo fishing, please, by all means, wear boots. I've had a lot, not a lot. I've had more than two friends have to go to the emergency room because when a Wahoo comes overboard and his mouth is going like this right here and he's got 6,000 razor blade teeth in his mouth, he's going to, he's going to cut something and we don't want it to be your foot. So long story short, back to the long line, when long line gets bit, <laughs> he springs off. I'm trying to entice more bites. If I get bit on like the right shore or if I get bit on the planer, the planer, we'll watch that and we'll try to, we'll kind of try to work that fish to the boat and keep our spread out. Uh, and that's all personal, experience and preference you just have to be very careful and keep a good eye on it make sure that fish stays down um but if i get bit on a short and i know hey there's a pretty good chance we're going to get tangled then we'll get them all up if my right you know that corner bait with a 48 ounce trolling weight gets hit i'm going to say hey boys you know clear the lines and when i say that when we're when we're wahoo fishing if there's three of us on the boat there's always one guy on the helm and then there's one guy is assigned to each side 
there's no switching back and forth and jumping. And if, you know, if this rod goes off, you know, this guy over here jumps across there. You need to be in your station and you need to be focused on what you have to do. Because like I said, you know, 200 yard run, 60 pound fish, things can get hectic pretty quick. And you, you want to kind of be in the, in the correct mind state to be able to accept that. All right. I think we're almost at the end. So now help me get that Wahoo in the boat. I mean, it's gone on the run. We've cleared the lines. I've brought it in and you are seeing my wide eyes and you're seeing how excited I am. And you're thinking, man, this guy might not be thinking too clearly. He might just be just jacked on adrenaline. And so what advice do you have to the angler and then, or how do you instruct him? What does the captain do? What does the mate do for the best chance of getting that fish in the boat? Okay. We always try to keep our fish at about a 45 degree angle to a 20 degree angle off of whatever corner, you know, he's, on the safest the safest corner i guess you could say like if we caught him on the left we're going to try to keep him on that left corner at about a 45 degree angle um, and i'm going to slowly turn the boat into the side where he's at that way i can always keep him at that 45 degree angle i want him off the corner of the boat i don't want him directly behind the boat i don't want him at a 90 degree off the side of the boat i want him off the corner wahoos will get to a point we call it the wahoo slide um, if you go check on my social media, I'm sure I have some pictures of a Wahoo slide. Uh, Wahoos will get gassed if, for lack of a better word, or, you know, they, their energy is expired. So they'll come to the surface and they'll open their mouth and their head will float right above the surface. And it's called a Wahoo slide. And what they're doing, they're just surfing right across the top of the top of the water. When they do that, you want to crank as fast as you can. And, and you want to keep that fish's head above the water. Because if he's in the water, he's breathing. If he's not in the water, he's not breathing. So it's it's going to help the angler. Wahoo slide that boat. I mean that fish. Wahoo slide that fish to the boat as fast as you can, safely. Um, get him to the corner of the boat. You're going to have the man on the rod, and you're going to have a gaff man. And remember, there's somebody on the wheel now. If 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 you have enough people there, you need somebody on the wheel. The man with the rod is going to pick up the rod in most cases. And when I say most, I mean 99% of the time, he's going to pick up the rod and he's going to walk towards the bow of the boat. Well, when he does that, that's going to pull the fish, you know, gunnel side of the boat or right beside the boat where the gaff man can gaff the fish. So the gaff man is going to gaff the fish. We always try, and there's two reasons why we always do it. We always try to gaff a wahoo behind the head. You want to gaff him right behind the head, right in the shoulder, as we call it. One, you're not messing up any fantastic meat. And two, you have a better chance of controlling him when he gets in the boat, which is you really don't have any control of him once you get him in the boat, but that's your best, uh, you know, angle, if you will. So you gap the fish right behind the head, you pull him in the boat and you're wearing boots. Okay. The angler with the rod has gone to the, towards the bow to get out of the way. And you want everybody clear. You don't want anybody else in that cockpit. When that gaff man brings that fish into the boat, I don't care if he's 10 pounds. I don't care if he's 110 pounds. You want nobody back there. When that man brings the fish into the boat, he's going to stick him down and push him towards the transom. And you want to stay away from the fish. Keep the fish put towards the transom. Do not pull the fish in the boat and then immediately take the gaff out of them. Don't do that. I'm telling you. If you want to make it back to shore, gaff the fish. And I'm not trying to scare anybody. Gaff the fish, stick him in the, tr in the deck of the boat and push him to the back and hold him there. And, and wait for him to expire because when he hits one he's going to flip out and he's going to be like all over the bottom of the boat or two he's going to lay there and play possum and you're going to think that everything's all good and as soon as you go to slide the gap out of him he goes haywire so keep him pressed up against the transom of the boat you give him a couple seconds somebody can open up the fish box don't worry about taking pictures right now i know the fish is all lit up and he's pretty and you can see his stripes and his purple on his back and his eyes are blue Slide the fish to the fish box or to the fish bag, or if your fish box is on the front of your boat, make sure everybody's out of the way and you walk backwards, pulling the fish to the front of the boat, to the fish box, you know, or however, wherever your storage is for that fish. Um, give it at least 30 minutes uh, before you take that fish out, please. There was a guy on, it was on Instagram and Facebook, and I think it was like 20 minutes after they had caught the fish, it was a, probably a 60 pound wahoo, he wanted to take a picture so they took the fish out of the bag and they're all taking pictures of the fish and the fish actually swung back and swiped and missed his neck by like this Jeez. much um so 
just remember, I mean, you're, this is an animal who has two things in his life that he has to do. He has to make babies and he has to eat. That's the only thing he has to do. So if he's not making babies, he's eating. So you're a meal. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> your foot's a meal. Your hand's a meal. Everything's a meal. So just be very careful. It's a dangerous fish. Um, it's a gorgeous fish. It's a tasty fish. I love it. I can't, I give, I got more respect for a Wahoo than probably most people have for any fish. Oh. Man, this has been good. I've tried to do my best sort of setting you up to cover the material. I, we're basically at the end of the podcast, but I always like to ask, man, is there anything else out there you'd like to get in? I mean, I think you just had a great little wrap up, you know, respect to the Wahoo, but I, I definitely want to give you the floor. Any, any last thoughts on Wahoo fishing, slow trolling, you know, maybe just a quick on the advantage in your mind of slow trolling over high speed. Yeah. Well, first, um, if I'm, if I'm going, if I'm fishing a tournament and I want to win a tournament with the biggest fish, I'm going to go high speed troll. If I want to go out and catch fish all day, I'm going to go slow trolling. Uh, and plus you get the bycatch too. You know what I mean? You're slow trolling for Wahoo. There's going to be dolphin in the area. There's going to be barracudas in the area. There's going to be black fin tuna. Sometimes yellow, we've caught yellow fin tuna. I'm not going to say where, because if I did, half of Carteret County would run out there right now. <laughs> but we've caught yellow fin tuna a lot closer to the beach than you would typically see on National Geographic. So um, I prefer slow trolling. It's a lot cheaper on fuel. You're not tearing a bunch of stuff up. Um, and and never fish by yourself. Always have somebody. Never go out there by yourself. I've done it like an idiot. I've been out there by myself, 50 miles offshore, wahoo fishing. And I mean, looking back now as a father, and you know, I'm getting older, so don't do that. Always have somebody with you. It, plus, it helps save on fuel. I mean, you're only you're splitting fuel with somebody instead of having to pay for everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I do. Um, always have your protective gear i mean it doesn't matter what kind of gloves or what boots whatever you wear you have to have gloves and you have to have boots um wear polarized sunglasses because when you get a wahoo to the boat sometimes there's something below it and you never know there's might there might be another wahoo below that one uh, pay attention to uh everything that's going on around you i say watch for birds if, if you see birds and they're and the birds are on something it's probably smaller bait which is getting eat by black fin tuna which is a delicacy to Wahoo. So if you see birds and you see bait and you have a slight little temperature break there and, and you're right on, on that between that 180 and 250 feet, I mean, odds are in your favor. You're going to catch a Wahoo. Well, Mike, you don't know much about a wolf, but I'll give you Wahoo. I'll give you Wahoo all day long. I and, appreciate it, man. And it was a great conversation, man. I mean, a great conversation. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Great communicator. Awesome. And, uh, you know, enjoyed it, man. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you for having me, man. Maybe I can go fishing with you and Rick one day. Because Rick, see, I watch Rick Croson. And when he's posting pictures of a lot of those, what we call bullet black fins, I'm like, yeah, he's catching those bullets. The, the, uh, we'll have a good school of Wahoo here directly. We'll, we'll, bring you, we'll bring you to fish with Rick, and then Rick and I will come fish with you. Yeah, man, absolutely. So okay. I guess, I mean, if, if you took everything and put it together, the biggest key to catching a Wahoo is information, which is – with any fish any fish you want to catch you've helped the cause man you have definitely helped the cause <laughs> billy what is up man man that what was a show. lot of information that was a ton of information and delivered i mean effectively like i again this isn't i thought i was clearly a, my wheelhouse i thought but i was I followed at a seminar. everything he said yeah i thought i was just in a seminar i thought i was at a fisherman's post fishing school which is good and one thing I took away from it, though, was like, um, you know, that thing wants to eat me. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm not like, surprised that's your best takeaway. You know, I mean, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not going to be the gaff guy probably ever in my entire life unless somebody, you know, maybe one day somebody will go, here, kid, take this. But if I ever do, and it's a Wahoo, I'm using that thing like a broom. I'm not going to try to grab it. And you know why you should be especially careful? I don't know what's happening. <laughs> It's getting late, Gary. We'll you know talking. why you should be especially careful? Because if I was a Wahoo and I came in the boat and I was looking around, you I'd be the, looking twice at you. I'd be like, that's the guy I'm going to take a bite eat, out of. Oh, that guy's got plenty. He won't miss it. I'm just going to get him. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. Where's the freaking end button on this podcast? Tell them Ridiculous. how to watch. Tell them how to listen. They know how to watch, Gary. They're watching. <laughs> <laughs> how to watch, how to listen. Uh, if you want to do one of the opposite of what you're doing right now, check us out on Spotify, Apple uh, Podcast, Podbean, Stitcher, Google Podcast. But most importantly, go subscribe to those channels, uh, especially on YouTube. They were trying to grow our YouTube channel, and we really appreciate when, uh, if you like the content that we're putting out, we work really hard to make this happen. Uh, so just hit that subscribe button, hit the little bell uh, so you can get notifications. And Gary, once again, we just want to shout out to Marine Warehouse Center for making all this possible. And if we, and I don't have a, a boat with 400 horsepower on the Five of them. Of the boat, <laughs> by the way. Where did Mike get that information? I don't know. I don't know. You guys don't know me. <laughs> oh, man. Maybe I have a friend with a kayak, <laughs> but that's about all. <laughs> oh man that's a good show gary good show all right anything else we're all done here it's a wrap and i'll yeah, see you next it. time we'll see Billy you next Thor. time man Fisherman.